Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It is such a treat to, you know, it's always a treat to do these interviews with, with the greatest luminaries in, in science and leadership and technology and culture, but it's all the more fun when you get somebody who is uh, a friend, a mentor, a collaborator, uh, just an all-around great guy. I think you're known as, uh, you know, the world's most likable uh, physicist. So, uh, David Kaiser, welcome to the Into the Impossible podcast. Brian, thanks so much. I'm glad to see that my check to you ahead of time has cleared. That's a good test that uh, I bribed you to say those wonderfully nice things, but, but I'm really just delighted to join you, and I really appreciate uh, the chance to talk with you. I, I'm, I'm yeah. glad to be here. I love all your books. You are actually, I should remind our listeners, you were the first guest on the Into the Impossible podcast when you came to visit UC San Diego about three years ago, four years ago maybe now in 2016. Yeah. That's so, right. It was only audio, none of this fancy video stuff. But on the other hand, we were able to sit next to each other and not have to be a continent or six feet apart. So. That's right. Yeah. It's a, in our case, it's a continent and six feet apart. I mean, we, <laughs> we, uh, we go the distance, literally. Um, right. So uh, we are here primarily to talk about uh, two things, I would say. Uh, what uh, you've just released this month, the book entitled Quantum Legacies, mm -hmm. now available, uh, it's published by University of Chicago Press. And uh, But the other thing is um, we've been kind of taking a little mission, a new mission statement for the podcast, and that's really deconstructing the kind of greatness of high achievers in all different fields. We've had on artists, and we've had on astronauts, and we've had on th plenty of physicists, uh, and I and I really, you know, just just delighted that we can talk with you and hopefully glean some insight into the various different hats you wear, from you know your wizard cap to your <laughs> to your uh, professor hat to your author hat. You've written uh, several books now, mm -hmm. and I can never pronounce the the um, honorific chair that you hold, the Germischenhausen. You you obviously cannot. Uh, it's the, <laughs> the Germischenhausen. I have other dear friends who like to call it the Gewurztraminer chair, which puts you in the right spirit. Nice sweet dessert wine. No, it's the the Germischenhausen professor. Of the history of science, also a professor of physics uh, here at MIT. Yes, and the new book, Quantum Legacies, is a wonderful book. And first when I, you know, I kind of uh, began reading it with the thought and slight trepidation, to be honest, that this would be another quantum mechanics book. There's been about 27 of them published in the last uh, year uh, about uh, right. from our friends. Uh, these are people yes. we know and we love. And, they're good uh, books, yeah. And they're, you know, and it's, it's always funny when each one sort of purports to be the definitive, you know, mm -hmm. this is the only description of quantum mechanics that you'll need. And before I picked up the book and started reading it um, during this this COVID period of quarantine, and I like to tuck into about eight different books at a time, mm -hmm. I started to think, God, I hope it's not another quantum interpretation book. And I yeah. said, hmm, I wonder what that stands for, NACWIB, not another quantum information book. And of course, you know this being an expert in Arabic etymologies. <laughs> the word NACWIB in Arabic means he who investigates and verifies. So... I, that is I fantastic. Just, I'd like to uh, add that to your honorific. I think you could be uh, the NACWIB chair. I will talk with the folks who, who control such things. I now have a new mission. Uh, I'll send the emails as soon as we're done talking here. That's great. So the book is a wide ranging. I have it in uh, electronic form only. Uh, I would, you know, we were not allowed to get uh, deliveries, uh, for, you know, through the n normal channels right. of the hard copy. But I'm going to get a hard copy, and this is a follow up. It, in it some ways, exist, I have to say, by the way, Brian, the physical copies exist. It has real pages. It's yes, an old fashioned book. It's it's out in the world, but it's hard. It's it's slowly getting out in the world because of the crisis. yes. I see. <clears throat> And um, what I uh, what I uh, immediately tried to do is sort of compare it and contrast it with your previous book, and we'll mm -hmm. roll in some footage of that, How the Hippies Saved Physics, uh, published in 2012. And that was, uh, that was a real tour de force. And I think that actually launched this new uh, movement, I have to say, into this uh, re-vivified you know, interest in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Do you want to just comment? Uh, did you, uh, did, was that your intent when you wrote that wonderful book? Oh, thank you, Brian. So, so I, I think the order of operations is a bit reversed. You know, um, causality is a tricky concept, uh, <laughs> but in this case, I, I really should correct the, the record. You know, that book, uh, which was a, just enormous joy to write, uh, uh, How the Hippies Saved Physics, I really just loved um, the, the ride. I've been working on that. But I don't think it's, it's fair to say that 
that that book helped jumpstart a, a return of interest into the Quantum Foundations. My interest in taking on that topic was certainly inspired by many, many colleagues all over the world uh, who, who for many years before, up until that time had already been really doing um, deeply creative, deeply challenging uh, and exciting work uh, in a kind of revived field of Quantum Foundations. So the order was certainly other super smart, dedicated people uh, digging into this with all they had. I was getting more and more excited and interested in it and, and uh, had this opportunity to write the, uh, a historical look, recent history, uh, you know, 40-ish, 50 years old, not, not going back to the Renaissance or something like that, but historical, really not the super contemporary uh, time period. Uh, on the other hand, again, as, as you well know, one of the really fun and, and for me really unexpected um, outcomes of that uh, was that after my book had come out, some friends and colleagues of mine, dear, dear mutual friends of yours and mine together, like Andy Friedman, uh, read the book kind of for fun. Uh, and then that helped to spark new discussions among our, our own little group. And so it brought me into more active work uh, as a physicist in the field of quantum foundations. The field was doing very, very well without me until that time, to be sure, and continues to. But, the, but working on the historical study helped really remind me of some things I had, I had been uh, glancingly kind of um, exposed to or aware of ahead, before working on the book more squarely. It opened up new things I hadn't known anything about beforehand. And then at, even after the book itself, it really was, was a pretty strong catalyst for what grew into a really uh, thriving and I think very exciting, fun international collaboration uh, that, that I've been just delighted to be able to, to take part in. Yeah, and that uh, is, of course, a major element of this book that we'll talk about. It's uh, right. near and dear, literally, to my heart here in San Diego. We have a right. mutual colleague who is described and even pictured in the book, Dr. Andrew Friedman, right. uh, that we'll get to when we cover this book. What's What's nice about this book is that it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure uh, in that you can really get the sense of the quantum mechanical impact on various and disparate fields ranging from cosmology to the early foundations of quantum mechanics, the history of quantum mechanics, and all the way up through, you know, popular culture and weaving its way through how uh, physics pedagogy and even scientific STEM pedagogy is taught to this very day. The impact of it is really traced so beautifully in this book. Uh, and you know, being a choose your own adventure book really offers the audience a lot of ability to kind of uh, pick and choose these delightful tidbits. It's exhaustively researched and referenced. I checked every reference, um, you know, several times, typed in manually uh, every single URL and uh, everyone was correct. So that's yes. wonderful. That's I do great. that with all the books, um, especially my <laughs> children's picture books, you know, the board books. You yeah. have to check the references in those board you, books. You better be careful. That's right. I want to uh, begin with the conclusion uh, because okay. it kind of, uh, it sort of came to me as, as almost like a mission statement of the book, perhaps a vision of how you did it. It's the final chapters about Stephen Hawking and covers yeah. um, your, um, your distant entanglement with him. And you right. never met him, you say in the book. I met him once uh, when he was giving a lecture at the Royal Society. And uh, it was very interesting, speaking of books, and I hope to spend some time today talking with you about your feelings about books and how they impact your life and why you became a writer. Yeah. Uh, but Stephen Hong was talking about his book, and during the question and answer period, he was still able to answer questions, not in real time, but, you know, five-minute, ten-minute delay. Mm -hmm. And this is in the mid-1990s. And someone asked him, you know, Professor Hawking, at the end of the talk, uh, why did you write this book? It's rumored that uh, no one understands it in its, com in its completeness. It's so uh, complex. It's so Byzantine and, and difficult for the layperson to understand. And yet so many people have it. Uh, what was your purpose in writing it? Mm -hmm. And he responded in a slow, you know, computer synthesized voice. I wrote it because my daughter had to go to college. And <laughs> right. of course, it brought down the house, but his humor was so mischievous. And you talk about how his personality really had, you know, spoken to you just, just as much through the final um, configuration, for lack of a better word, that his, that, his, um, that his countenance, his face was left in, was one of this mercurial smile and how it impacted yeah. on you. I want to read from the, the last sentence, the last paragraph. No spoiler alerts. We're not going to – I don't typically like to ask, you know, can you explain your entire book so that nobody has to read it? Um, no, I want people to buy every single copy, and uh, hopefully the, uh, one outcome will be you do an audio version someday. But anyway, the last sentence is, I never met Stephen Hawking, but the idea of him and several of his ideas ideas have been with me for much of my life. Mm 
May his example continue to inspire young people to beat the odds and to ask big, ungainly questions about the universe. It seems like he did have this huge impact on you. And of course, we're observing the second anniversary just recently of his passing. Um, on uh, Einstein's birthday, who also right. appears in this book. Uh, tell us a little bit about what Stephen Hawking meant to you, to quantum mechanics, and the legacy that he cast over the union of quantum mechanics and cosmology. It, it's, it, that's a great question, Brian. Thanks. So I, I, I didn't ever meet him in the sense of having anything like a direct interaction. I was in rooms with him. So in that sense, I was near him physically on, on a few, a very small number of occasions. Um, and that was, as, as, as you know, and, and perhaps many um, folks you know, uh, hearing or listening to the, the podcast would also know from footage or from their own personal experience, you know, it was, it was a really s striking kind of experience. Uh, I first uh, got sort of physically, physically proximate to him, as I said, didn't meet him, but was close to him um, when he came to visit for about three weeks in the autumn of uh, 1999, so just over 20 years ago, I guess, uh, he came to visit Harvard um, to give a series of public lectures, some of them very broad uh, you know, pu public lectures for non-specialists of the sort that he, of course, was, had gotten very, very good at, and a few more technical um, lectures a intended for specialists, but given his star power by that point, they were still held in an enormous auditorium because everyone wanted to hear even the esoteric stuff. Um, and he, therefore, he and his, you know, team of nurses and assistants and grad students and really the whole kind of entourage, therefore set up shop for about three weeks in the physics building. And I was just finishing my, my uh, graduate work there. So I had a little kind of desk in a shared office in a different wing of the building. And so I, I was there a few of times into the uh, sort of early to middle evening. Again, certainly I never, I never had the gumption to, to interrupt the, the professor um, directly. I didn't feel that there was any need for that. He, was, he had enough on going on. But I think it tends to talk with some of his students and the nurses and just the kind of support team around him and, and be near in the room. And that itself was really fascinating. You have the constant you know, kind of compressors and various kind of medical equipment that's keeping him uh, really, really going. And then I don't want to call it an aura. I don't want to make it mystical. But there was just a sense that this was not an, not an ordinary encounter. But there was a kind of constant hum and a buzz of activity. Some of it literally a buzz from the instrumentation, uh, and otherwise just a, a kind of you know a sense of this is an unusual uh, unusual thinker in in very unusual uh, situations. Uh, and I found and that really that really stuck with me. Of course, much younger than that, I was in high school. I, because you and I were both in high school. I think we're basically exactly the same age. Yeah, um, the perfect age to be. That's right. But we we were you know. When, he, when his a big, most, most famous book came out, I was a, a mid to late high school student, probably a junior year or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, A Brief History of Time. And, and uh, you know, I, I certainly grabbed up my copy like so many people around the world had done. And I really did read it, or at least tried to read it through. By that point, I was already a, a, a concerted kind of popular physics junkie. I was devouring lots of books, some of the very, very good popular books that were just coming out over the course of the 80s on physics, on cosmology, on quantum mechanics, and some wonderful juicy topics. And this was another one, and for me, this was another one in that series that had already been kind of hooked. And I did think that there was a kind of especially charming way that Hawking had put that book together, which you may remember. He has, you know, some compelling analogies and metaphors about abstract phenomena, about a, a, a black hole, even a kind of what we would call a classical black hole without even worrying about the complications from quantum theory. Uh, he has passages in there about the Big Bang that have, has come to occupy so much of my thinking and yours in, in our later years. But it was interweaved with these kind of personal reflections or little stories about, about his personal life, which was such an unusual kind of journey. And looking back, that was actually pretty unusual. That became a more common, um, yeah. almost a kind of template, let's say, for writing books. Uh, you and I have each used those devices in some of our own more recent books. Um, I don't think it's a bad one, but I think Hawking was ahead of the curve in trying to really write not exactly a memoir or an autobiography, and not exactly a kind of depersonalized popular book that only talks about concepts and analogies. It was a, a, sometimes a very sweet and charming and, and even moving um, kind of combination. So I was hooked on, on, let's say, an image of Hawking in that sense from when I was uh, pretty young. And then uh, roughly 10 years later, I was at least sort of getting into the field myself and had this kind of close encounter, let's say. 
Uh, and then even a little more recently, closer to, to before he, he passed away, I was involved with a number of colleagues, it grew to be on the order of 30 colleagues, uh, writing really basically just a short, um, almost like an op-ed length uh, kind of popular article about some of our current understanding about the early universe, the time uh, kind of roughly near the Big Bang. Uh, and we had invited uh, Stephen Hawking to be one of the kind of co-signers, co-authors of this short, really just a few paragraphs. Uh, and so we, with so my 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 own senior colleagues and co-authors sent the draft. They had they knew Hawking uh, reasonably well professionally, and we got back an email the next day where he basically objected to the phrasing on you know in paragraph two. And my colleagues who'd known him some of them for decades said, "Oh, that's it. He won't do it. He's 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 so stubborn. You know, you'll never change his mind." And I, being innocent of that experience, sort of naively said, "Well." It's not a crazy suggestion he made, his suggested edit. What if we just, you know, tweak sentence number two and add a semicolon? And what if we just try to edit it and respond to his actual, you know, earnest feedback? So he's like, oh, okay, so we do that. We send it back. And then the next day we got another email saying he agreed, he liked the edits, and he'll sign on. And the kind of, you know, moment of euphoria to realize that, that I still had never, you know, interacted in any serious or substantial way with Professor Hawking, but, but I, had, uh, I had in some small way beaten the odds by by getting around his, uh, his legendary stubbornness. So, so I had these moments um, of, 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 of attenuated encounters. But as you, as you rightly said, I mean, many of the ideas for which he's so well known uh, in our field, you know, they have been uh, with me in one form or another, and, and I think with you and so many of our colleagues. Since we were very young people, now we get to work, we have the great privilege to work on many of those ideas and try to nudge them forward in our own work today. Uh, and, and that's just, an it's, a, it's a great thrill. And, uh, and I guess I did like the fact that, you know, later in life, he'd appear in comedic YouTube videos with Paul Rudd playing quantum chess. He'd show up in the, on the sitcom, The Big Bang Theory. He clearly had a kind of sense of self that he knew he was uh, this kind of icon um, and very unusual scientific persona. But he, he seems, at least in these outward appearances, to at least on occasion not take himself too seriously. Let, let, let himself play with the notion of being this crazy, hyper-famous, very unusual kind of person. And I thought that was just so delightful. And as you say, his, you know, as, as the physical uh, disease wore on, I, to my mind, I thought his, his face kind of settled into a, what I did call that impish grin. Uh, and that really kind of made sense to me. Yeah, that is certainly, you know, a notion that it seemed, you know, very authentic with him. It wasn't you know, cultivated or forced in, in some sense. He who was, uh, he seemed to, um, you know, relish this this role of being in society. And and obviously the um, uh, the film made about his life uh, was it was another uh, you know kind of indelible mark that he left on the culture as well as on the physics itself. I think you know there's many, and you're much more a scholar about. The, the the history of, of physics in particular, but you know there are these notions of, of physicists, especially Einstein and Hawking, um, that are almost supernatural, and you wonder, you know, is it really deserved at a certain level? And you know, thinking about Einstein, he actually certainly does seem to earn that title based on everything that he did accomplish in his life and how inventive and creative he was. And I think you know what was interesting about about Hawking. Was that he? He was okay with changing his mind, and he was he had that same scientific um, uh, sort of dispassion, where he wasn't you know entirely consumed with the notion of his legacy, and that somehow burnished his legacy even more. Famously, you know, changing his mind, as our mutual friend uh, Sir Roger Penrose would say, right. you know, it doesn't matter if you agree. Or, or, you know, if you believe this about black hole information paradox or the opposite of that, because you're in agreement with Stephen Hawking either way. <laughs> <Right>. And I, <laughs> uh, right. you know, thinking about him and then one of our colleagues here, the director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, uh, Dr. Eric Veery, PhD, MD. He uh, was one of the flight surgeons that mm -hmm. uh, went uh, to certify that uh, Professor Hawking could fly in zero gravity, along with right. Dr. Peter Diamandas, MIT mm -hmm. alum. Mm -hmm. And the two of them, you know, kind of teaming up for this wonderful, you know, brilliant mind to slip the surly bonds of gravity mm -hmm. and uh, play in these in these gravitational uh, playgrounds. It was just uh, it's a delight that we have this connection. And I think, you know, the the linkage between between Hawking and 
uh, and the thread that r runs through these books, I'm sure that you get a lot of um, requests to uh, review books or to uh, review book proposals. You know, one of the things I, I never knew about the about the um, you know, the process of writing a book. And uh, again, I want to, you know, thank people, uh, thank you publicly in front of everybody for endorsing my book, blurbing my book, uh, added to, to my, uh, to the pantheon of, of physics royalty who endorsed it. Uh, but I never knew that, you know, books went through this proposal process and the construction of books. And I want to talk about books in particular, uh -huh. because you are so uh, voluminously uh, creative in terms of public, um, uh, you know, popular science, as we'd say, trade science. But you're also, you know, a day-to-day card-carrying physicist and capable of doing and having con contributed to many significant breakthroughs and, and paths forward, not just in quantum physics, but also in cosmology. Including a very, I, I partic in particular enjoyed this description where you spoke about this this theory of r tangentially related to the Higgs theory and um, spontaneous symmetry breaking, right. and really being candid that you had some ideas and essentially you got scooped. And I want to take our, our listeners through what is the similarity, what is the contrast between writing, say, for the popular audience and writing a technical paper. I mean, it's hard to imagine you get scooped out of writing how the hippies, you know, save physics, but, uh, or, or this book. But how is it working on the front lines of scientific inquiry being pursued by perhaps an unknowable mass of, of people arrayed, you know, to, to uh, compete with you? Well, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's a good question. So these days, uh, my main way of coping with that is, is trying best I can to surround myself with extraordinarily talented, very hardworking young people. <laughs> How do any of us get anything done at our, uh, you know, wizened age? Um, and we, but, and I, I joke, uh, but it is the case that having a bunch of pairs of eyes among close colleagues and collaborators, including students and, and advisees, you know, so we can, we can, we can, each be taking a turn kind of looking not exactly over our shoulders. I don't mean to make it sound like we're all kind of paranoid. Sometimes we are. But, um, but really to say there's, you know, the, even the little sub, sub, sub fields, even the specialties within specialties in which we aim to make our, a contribution, um, you know, those, those have, have in general grown in size uh, over the last, even just in the 25-ish years that I've been uh, active um, uh, trying to contribute to these things. Um, that you know, you really look over the our our beloved uh, preprint server, the archive. You know, pretty much every day, because uh, there's because the odds are better than even that someone did something interesting or novel or curious or something that you really better be aware of. You know, m many days of the of any given week of every week of the year, weekends, you know, and evenings included. It's relentless and it's exhausting, and and I find I can only try to approximate kind of keeping up in that sense by really it becomes a team effort even for theorists i mean unlike you i don't um for my theoretical work in in uh early universe cosmology i'm not building instruments i don't have you know an enormous team uh to try to 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 get to work together it might be you know two to five people but we just need a couple pairs of eyes both to think through our own ideas and refine them and work hard and it's the kind of pleasure they're actually a genuine pleasure of just getting lost, you know, losing the sense of time, and which I still get that feeling, getting in the kind of zone when you're when it's really deep in the calculations. You just want to know, but there's all, and, and that's fantastic. And there's also the role of what are our other, you know, very smart colleagues of, of whom there are seemingly more every day, or at least lots and lots of them. What do they? What did they do last night? And, how, and how, what did they post to the archive? You know, in the last uh, day or two or three. So that's a long way of saying it, 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 it does take, even for, for theoretical investigations, I think it takes you know, more, than, more than one person trying to juggle, push the ideas forward, check and recheck and make sure we're not fooling ourselves or making some mistakes, and at the same time, keep at least some level of awareness of what's out there. Now, coming to, to your larger question, the time scale of that, it really is kind of day to day. And the time scale, for me at least, of trying to think about a book, um, you know, they're quite different. So the, the hippies book I wrote from in what was for me lightning speed, and I say that as a joke, faster than I wrote my earlier book, right, by a lot. Uh, but that still meant it's measured in, in years, not days or weeks. Um, and so it's a different, kind of, a different kind of intellectual work to try to keep 
um, scales of, of a kind of, uh, of an argument of sources of every footnote that, that I know Brian's going to double check, you know, by hand when the thing comes out. There's just a lot of moving parts in a monograph that's going to be on the order of, say, 300 pages and 1,000 footnotes. That's a different kind of object um, than a, a physics article that might wind up being seven pages with, you know, 30 references. Um, and so, so, I, so it's a different series of kind of mental steps for me, at least. I tend to think about what's the overall big um, argument, what's the kind of arc for a book that I, as, and it kind of emerges from the mist, so you don't, don't know it all at once right away. Um, and then how can I kind of operationalize that? What are the parts of that that I need to get straight to, to contribute to this overarching argument that I ultimately think um, is original and interesting and, and hopefully some people might find, you know, might learn from or find interesting. So that means thinking about chapter structure, about different kinds of sources. You know, historians will always talk about primary sources and secondary sources. What have other scholars, other historians or scientists or sociologists or philosophers, what have they written about on related topics? Um, uh, and then what is, what's the, just the kind of newer cool stuff that uh, hasn't necessarily been out there that other people haven't been scouring or, or aware of? things that weren't originally published, private notes or correspondence or um, unpublished grant proposals or whatever the kind of materials might be. Uh, a lot of interviews, a lot of my historical work, even in this most recent book, has been fairly recent history where many of the people I'm writing about are, are still alive. So I can talk with them or email or some combination of telephone or whatever. And so there's a lot of ways of gathering our, our what we might call data, you know, historians will call kind of evidence of primary sources, and what, how do those fit in different kind of bins in the chapter structure in the overall argument? And that, that whole process is very iterative, a lot of, of it going back and revising and thinking through again. And the natural time scale for that is measured in months and years, not, not days and weeks. That's a, that's a really intriguing way to look at the, uh, the differences between the two, but also, yeah, there's similarities. I mean, I found it fascinating to see you might construct an equation and a series of sentences, a paragraph that takes a month, six months, you know, and then data obviously can take years to acquire, to massage, and then to, to get into a publishable form. Mm -hmm. Um, I came, I came away with, and I don't know if it was by design, but it was sort of the, the different themes in the book echo through the different ways in which the universe reveals itself to us. Mm -hmm. And I always say as astronomers, uh, we kind of have a more challenging life than, than physicists, experimental physicists do. An experimental physicist can take two protons and smash them together, traveling very close to the speed of light, right. and see what kind of a shrapnel and debris emerge. And then they can do that, you know, protons are fungible after all, so they can, you know, do that many, many times. They can do different things and, and actually do true experiments and see how right. the results uh, compared to the objects that are c under control and quarantine like we are all now. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but, in, but in effect, astronomers have a much more challenging uh, uh, you know, task in front of them in that we can't really do an experiment where we right. ask, we change the temperature of the sun, you know, how, uh, how will that affect the density of neutrinos going through the Earth at a given moment? Right. And in your book, you cover really the three different, uh, if you like, uh, you know, phylum of, of ways that astronomers and physicists can probe the quantum uh, mm -hmm. through matter in the case of a massive matter, perhaps in the form of, of neutrinos. You talk about right. the origin of the uh, of the theory that neutrinos have mass rather but Ponte Corvo and, and others neutrino oscillations right experiments that you're involved with uh, and then an experiment very close to your home uh, at least originated very close to you at MIT uh, the uh, the the famous LIGO experiment mm -hmm. which uh, uses waves of gravitation not waves of light or mm -hmm. neutrinos in any way and then uh, and a, and a regime of of uh, of kind of massless messengers that come to us from deep space, uh, you spend a lot of time in, uh, in a fascinating chapter called Quantum Theory by Starlight. Yes. Uh, which uh, details the origin and evolution and your role and, and our colleagues, our mutual colleagues, Jason Galicchio and Andy Friedman, right. uh, along with Anton Zeilinger's group in, in uh, Vienna. And you describe this detective story 
And I wonder if we can go deep on this particular chapter. Uh, again, these three different modalities that physicists can taste the universe. And that's really all we get. We get that and a couple of meteorites. And uh, that's all we get from Mother Nature right. or God. It depends on your perspective. So walk us right. through the quantum theory by Starlet. What intrigued you? And I mean, look, you're a very productive physicist. You're a very productive author. You're a teacher. You're a well-respected mentor. Now you're dean for some reason. You got hit on the head with an I-beam. You became uh, associate dean. dean. Let, let associate Associate dean. Okay, associate dean. so you're not the crusty old dean; you're just the associate uh, old dean, um, a young dean. Uh, tell me, how do you decide to turn your attention to a subject like this? What 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 criteria do, do, does it have to pass in order for it to you know be worthy of the Kaiser the Kaiser rule? Yeah, I don't, I, I wish I had a rule. It would make, <laughs> make my life easier. <laughs> with, with the with the, uh, the the chapter you're referring to, Brian, the quantum theory by Starlight, as of course as you know, it's it's about these um, experiments that we call the cosmic bell experiments. Uh, and I mean, really, without without question, just hands down, that whole experience for me has been just an absolute highlight of of my career, of my life. Um, it it's been just this unbelievably rewarding, you know, kind of roller coaster, emotional roller coaster, and intellectual one, but a, just a rewarding. Um, adventure, and I just I can't say enough how lucky I I feel to have been able to to work on it, to experience it, to try to contribute toward it. Uh, met a number of new colleagues uh, who, who I now consider really very very dear friends, as well as others who were already friends. I got to work with even more. So it was it was just just a series of wins all around. Plus, it was just really cool, and we learned some cool stuff, and you know, added benefit intellectually as well. So, uh, and again, that's the project that grew in some you know, non-direct, kind of non-linear way, had at least part of its origins from my earlier historical book, that book on uh, how the hippies say physics, which was really a, a kind of history of who cared about topics like quantum entanglement when, before that topic had really become uh, mainstream in the physics land, before kind of all of us knew we'd better pay attention and teach it to our students and put it in our textbooks. There was a long period uh, during which some of the ideas were being clarified, but in small little um, you know, uh, enclaves and not really percolating to the whole discipline. And that's what I was immersing myself in in that historical project. And then with Andy Friedman and, and then with his good friend from graduate school, Jason Galicchio, the three of us began talking soon after that book had come out about what what could we bring to the topic of quantum entanglement and especially these experiments, these, these kind of relentless efforts to test quantum entanglement, which themselves had stretched over uh, 40 years by that point, now nearly basically 50 years, that what can we bring to that un unfolding discussion from our vantage point as astrophysicists or cosmologists, uh, who had not been very central to this, to this topic uh, for much of the history. And so we began thinking about what could we, what could we use from our day job, it was one of our day jobs, which is to study the, the kind of contours of our cosmos, of our observable universe, over time scales stretching back to the time of the Big Bang itself, roughly 14 billion years ago. And as you know very well, and you've done so much to help us all learn, you know, we, we've understood what we can call the causal structure of the universe. So over that 14 billion year period when the universe is stretching, it's stretching, we know, at different rates, at different moments in that history, um, some sort of regions, some locations in space could have been able to kind of talk with each other by exchanging a light signal and others could not have yet. And so there's a causal structure. Could an event A possibly have had an impact on event B, where and when? And, and one of our jobs as, as cosmologists is to kind of map that out and see how that causal structure has changed and evolved over, over the 14 billion years of our observable universe. And so we wanted to bring uh, Andy and Jason, I wanted to bring those kinds of questions and insights to bear on, on a topic that is usually uh, considered actually only on, on kind of a desktop scale, on a kind of human or smaller scale, meaning quantum entanglement. The behavior of pairs or triples or, or multiple particles that are prepared in special ways. It won't happen, you won't see this effect if you take any two random particles, but uh, specially prepared, uh, say, pairs of particles. Uh, and we can perform experiments on each member of those pairs, and we find these remarkably... Um, sort of surprising correlations in the outcomes. It's almost like if people would remember the newlywed game, you and I remember that game, no, it's, we're old. Young people don't know that, you can Google it. But basically any, any kind of quiz where you imagine asking questions of two people who are kind of isolated from each other so they shouldn't be able to cheat and, and confer. They shouldn't be able to kind of 
make their answers agree by talking or exchanging you know, tweets or whatever. So you have them in like isolation booths and you ask them a series of, of basically questions at random and see how often their answers agree when you try to shield against these kind of cheating mechanisms where, which, would, which would make it clear why their answers would agree. Okay. So we wanted to bring the kind of causal structure of the cosmos, how could A have influenced B, to bear on these questions on why do pairs of particles in these experiments show such remarkable agreement when asked seemingly random questions and they're kind of far away from each other. Uh, and so our, our answer, our proposal really, which we dreamed up just the three of us uh, at first, was to try to use random numbers from the sky. We wanted to turn the universe, this big, enormous, gorgeous universe uh, that we are lucky to be in, uh, turn that into basically a pair of random number generators, as if the universe were flipping a coin on our behalf or flipping two coins separately on our behalf. And so what that meant in real terms was to perform real-time observations of, of pairs of very distant objects in the sky on opposite sides of the sky. So the light's coming from one side here and from the other side here. And you have to be super careful. The light could only have gotten to this receiving station before it could have gotten elsewhere. So again, there's no opportunity for the kind of cheating or coordination that we're trying to shield against. And now you can play a game and say, well, depending on your budget and or the patience of your collaborators, you know, how distant a pair of objects do you want to aim for to, bring, to, to give you this kind of random signal on very, very short timescales, in our case, really just tiny fractions of a second, uh, effectively um, um, microseconds, millionth of a second. So we're constantly taking in new observations of, these, of, of different astronomical objects in every fraction of a second and turning that into basically a plus one or a minus one. Uh, we were, what we actually were doing is measuring the color of the light of that object. Is it more red or more blue in that window uh, compared to some average color for that object and, and, and separately for the other object there? We first did that with bright stars in our own galaxy, Milky Way stars, that are far from Earth. In human terms, they're trillions of miles away. They're far. In galactic terms, these are like our nearest neighbors or among our nearest neighbors. It's nothing, right? These objects emitted their light hundreds or thousands of years ago in a 14 billion year old universe. That's, that's an eye blink in cosmic terms. So we did our first test using these small hobby telescopes. The, uh, uh, they were Mead telescopes. You, know, you can literally just commercially buy them from uh, kind of uh, astronomical hobby shops. They were great, they worked great. They had, I think, eight inch and 10 inch you know, uh, kind of collecting zones, not so big. And then on the strength of that, pilot test where we, by which I really mean uh, my colleague Anton Zeilinger, who is both an extraordinary physicist and a very, very effective negotiator, <laughs> I have to say, to our, uh, luckily for us, he basically was able to, to talk our way into some really gorgeous, absolutely amazing professional telescopes, each of which had a polished mirror on the order of 13 feet across and like four, four meter telescopes uh, on a mountaintop in the Canary Islands, the island of La Palma. So then, with these much bigger light-gathering surfaces, these huge telescopes, we can do that same thing, is the light this microsecond more red or more blue, but not from you know, nearby stars, but from very distant quasars, extremely bright galaxies. The light from which we receive just that moment on the mountaintop have been traveling for much of the history of the universe, for 8 billion years on one side, for 12 billion years on the other side. So now you're talking about genuinely cosmological distances. All that is just to take in random numbers from the sky in a way that we assume we're not connected with each other, partly because of that causal structure argument I mentioned, that were not received on Earth until the very fraction of a second that we happen to open up the telescope and, and look and click. So it couldn't be kind of previewed by the other parts of, of the apparatus on the island. All that's just basically as if we were flipping a coin to make random choices every split second, but what measurements to perform on this pair of entangled particles that we made, that we created here on Earth, that Anton and his amazing group created, using a pump laser and a special set of electronics, and it's really um, amazing. A special crystal can split the beam in very specific ways. It's awesome. I mean, watching them at work was for me just, just I mean, jaw-dropping. They're, they're absolute, they're really wizards. Uh, and so the entanglement that we were able to measure, the, the really quite extraordinary evidence we were able to add on top of generations of positive evidence that have been there for, for by now nearly 50 years, uh, was that we find these spooky correlations 
in the outcomes of measurements on these earthbound particles, they're far from each other. They're on, in our experiment, on the order of a kilometer or two apart. So they're far away. They can't be cheating by talking in real time. They can't send the light signal at that moment to say, I just answered plus one, make sure you do as well. But they're answering questions that were determined by these really cosmically distant random events. Uh, and so we put all that together, so we called it a cosmic bell test. The bell part is named in honor of uh, the physicist John Bell. We added the cosmic part. Um, and it was a way to try to, to ask, you know, could the world be as strange and as, as counterintuitive as our beloved equations of quantum theory tell us, relentlessly tell us. This is a, an unavoidable feature of quantum mechanics, as smart people have clarified over, over much of a century. Is, is the world working that way or just our equations? And we wanted to test that, that basic tension as thoroughly, as, kind of, um, as creatively as we could, turning the universe itself into a kind of player in that, in that adventure. That was a long answer. It shows you how much fun I had putting it together. <laughs> it grew into a team of about 20 people. So it really took lots of people to get you know, the electronics and the astronomy and, and the theoretical work. And it was just an absolute delight. It was fun from day one to, to the end. Yeah, that is, uh, it comes through with great clarity. It's an adventure story as I um, scribble in notes in the book, you know, kind of is this, uh, you're this in Indiana Jones and, and your colleagues, obviously, Andy, Jason, Anton, etc., and the young graduate students. And that really made me think about, you know, how do we train these people? If you say to somebody, you're going to learn about quantum mechanics and you're going to do so, you know, in a, uh, with a 20 foot shipping container, you know, as it flies down the side of a mountain in the Canary Islands. Yeah, if right. you, if you, you know, if you were to, you know, tell somebody ahead of time that that's what they were going to encounter, maybe they wouldn't want to sign up. Uh, they'd be a little more hesitant to turn down that job at uh, Goldman Sachs or something. Uh, but I want to now segue into this topic of pedagogy. You're known sure. as a as a master teacher, and uh, you have a, um, a cadre of uh, compatriots uh, that you have learned the craft from. But I wanted to kind of take a step back uh, into you know the origin of, of pedagogy, as you talk about in the sort of the atomic section of the book, where you you, you look at the atomic legacies, the nuclear age legacies, right. and the, the fact that uh, World War II was declared to be the physicist war, yeah. uh, so much so that physicists would get police escorts and have uh, top secret clearances and mm -hmm. and even go to these you know one of the 30 nuclear you know sites around the world of course few people a lot of people know about the manhattan project it's mm -hmm. been detailed it's made its way into the psyche the neuroses if you will or the zeitgeist uh, you know for many many decades now fewer right. people know about the radar project that was mm -hmm. led at lincoln mm -hmm. labs and mit and that eventually led to uh, explosions in the in knowledge of of not the atom, but of the cosmos, because it led directly yes. to the development of radar technology that mm -hmm. became radio telescope technology that led to the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, which is what yes. I study. Yes, yes. Uh, and so there's a direct line through that war. Mm -hmm. What I, I, as again, I don't like to, you know, really reveal too much about the book. So I'll just say that the the description of how you know physicists uh, attain this prestige. And even the prestige dynamics within the field of physics, in other words, which subfield of physics is it more yeah. prestigious to be right. a member of? Uh, theory versus experiment, nuclear versus, um, you know, electromagnetism, uh, condensed matter. Right. Uh, now we have biophysics. And I, I actually do want to segue into that. Uh, again, I don't want to talk too much about the, you know, give away, spill the beans of the book, because right. I think it's such uh, a wonderful journey. I don't want to spoil it. But I want to get your impressions about two things. One yeah. is uh, what will the outcome of our current war, which is this war against this invisible uh, enemy uh, called the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus and how we can, or the, the coronavirus uh, and the COVID disease associated with it, and how it may have the ability in some way, despite the tragic, awful loss even of a single life, of course, being mm -hmm. so exponentially tragic. But um, could there be any positive outcomes. For example, could you envision that as World War II was the physicist war, that perhaps uh, this war, um, may it always be peaceful <laughs> among nations, but, uh, but against this enemy, could it lead to the biologist war? And perhaps as the, bi as the physicist war led to the, you know, what was called the century of physics, maybe this will be the century of biology. 
Well, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, Brian. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on it. So uh, this podcast goes seven hours. Is that right? Do yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's that midway point for most of them. Yeah. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, good. I, I have my, my, my lemonade. I, I'm good. For, I'm good for the, for the hall. Um, yeah, no, I, I, you know, a, a couple of thoughts. Number one, even just very locally here at MIT, partly because I do have this new administrative role, this associate dean thing, with my very dear colleague, my co-associate dean, uh, Julie Shaw, we've been um, uh, working very hard uh, locally and with colleagues even at other campuses um, to try to um, actually connect researchers in many, many fields, not just biological ones, who didn't often have the opportunity to kind of meet or work together, because we do think this challenge requires, um, you know, a, a really many-headed, many, many kinds of expertise will be required. And so in, locally, that means um, economists, in, including really quite renowned economists who are experts in healthcare and public policy, experts in management, uh, in logistics and supply chains, think about you know, making sure the hospitals have even a, even a little bit of the equipment that we know they're going to need, let alone as much as they possibly can. How do we smartly help um, decision makers allocate things? Uh, computer scientists and modelers, even, even uh, theoretical physicists, let alone people who really know about these things. Um, there are standard modeling techniques and epidemiological modeling, but some really uh, very powerful newer techniques in how we estimate parameters for these things, how we do real-time data analysis, uh, and we've been able to help not only us, of course, but in, in, in dialogue with many kinds of colleagues, put together teams that it's not actually just sort of biologists. We obviously need uh, epidemiologists and biostatisticians and public health officials uh, to, and, and biophysicists and, and more. But what's been, what I didn't quite foresee ahead of time was how much groups could be coagulated, you know, uh, that in, in, in maybe some unexpected ways with, with even more sort of eyes on, including historians and, and anthropologists of medicine. What about, you know, compliance issues in previous pandemics? Uh, it's one thing to have what looks like a best laid plan, but if it's having, uh, if, if, if folks, um, you know, don't believe that's going to help them or, or don't trust the authorities who are telling them to do it, then you have another set of, of, of human-based concerns to worry about. So it really does require a huge range of expertise. I'm going to, now I'm going to, I'm going to, um, tell you my thoughts on the war analogy. I, I actually, I worry about the repeated use of the war in this, to describe the current pandemic challenge. It's an emergency. It is a, an enormous um, challenge around the world, as we know with clarity every day. Here's why I bristle at the war analogy. When people make the reference to the Manhattan Project or radar, a, a great example that you mentioned, I think in the, in the current context, I think what they mean is we, and, and with this part I agree, we need enormous resources. We do need, in fact, multidisciplinary teams, as those teams indeed had been in the, in the 1940s. We need resources, priorities, and many eyes and hands on the job. It is a super high priority, and it is a, a, a matter of, a, alas, a matter of life and death. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a, a pretty good analogy to the Manhattan Project and the Rad Lab, the kind of emergency footing. On the other hand, you know, every war, at least every war that I know of in human history, ended because humans made decisions to stop fighting. We can't negotiate with this pathogen, right? It's not a war in that sense. What, and if we, if we continue sitting up in, in a war framework, then, well, then when does this war end? What would victory even mean? We're not going to eradicate this thing. It's going to be around on the earth, you know, probably forever. At least it's more likely to assume that than otherwise. Uh, in the meantime, let's take those examples that you mentioned, the Manhattan Project and the Rad Lab. Uh, they they functioned because of two kinds of secrecy. And I think we have to be super careful about both of them right now and really avoid both of them. Both projects at the time were classified from the general public. No one could know about them who wasn't uh, very, very in, in a very small circle of experts. Uh, so they were secret from the community and there was enormous compartmentalization even within them. Uh, general Le Leslie Groves, who uh, really managed the entire Manhattan Project, was very, very concerned about things like espionage. And so he wanted to make it nearly impossible for any one person to accumulate too much information about the whole project. So even experts who had clearance to work on it could not know about what kind of neighboring efforts were doing. And, uh, and, and we, don't, we can't have that today either. So we can't be doing this work in, pri in, in secrecy from, from, the, uh, from the public that we want so much to, to try to be um, helpful with and for. And we can't do it in mutual ignorance either. 
And so how that, one of the ways that manifests now is, you know, people who are working on, for example, on epidemic modeling and parameter estimation, we have to make our code publicly available, right? Uh, it's not enough to write a paper with your equations of your model. We need to see how the code's implemented. And I say that because with some colleagues just in the last few weeks, I've been involved uh, in some of this epidemic modeling myself, uh, some quantitative modeling, modeling skills that I could try to lend. And we found that we couldn't reproduce at all the results of one group that had written a paper uh, in public, but we don't know. They didn't release their code. We get nothing like what they did. Several of us independently implement, tried to implement their model. We matched each other, nothing like what in their paper. So we can't figure out what we're doing wrong or, or, or what they were. Another group, we found a bug in their code and it actually led to a pretty important diff way to interpret the output of their, of their models. But we could find that because that other group really had done what I consider the right thing and it made their code fully and easily and freely publicly available. Those are pretty important disanalogies from the wartime efforts. High priority multidisciplinary life and death, yes. It's not a war because we can't negotiate a surrender and we can't, we just can't do it with the kinds of secrecy internal and beyond that had marked those projects. Yeah, that's uh, those are those are all, of course, very um, important distinctions between this. And, and of course, you know, war is usually a zero sum game. And uh, I guess the, the thought that I'm thinking is, you know, perhaps there there could be a it, it could be a positive sum game, not for the virus, but for resiliency of future um, uh, responses. We know that these viruses don't go away; they're almost impossible to cure, quote unquote, to vaccinate per, uh, permanently, uh, obtain herd immunity uh, is very challenging and so especially these novel viruses uh, and that right. mutate that evolve mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we, we all hope of course that these efforts including yours will be successful uh, as a associate dean as an associate dean I want to now turn to um, uh, the role that uh, universities are playing uh, have played and perhaps will play in education and I take uh, note of the fact that there's an awful lot that MIT in particular does uh, to out open source their your your productions your lectures uh, not every course but there's a tremendous amount of open courseware I believe is what you call it and right, it's yeah. and you've been doing this for a decade I mean you could find videos going back almost decade. two decades no, they were yeah. very early, uh, early 2000s yeah that's right and uh, they're just phenomenal I use them sometimes when I'm preparing courses here in yeah. San Diego um, but uh, kind of putting on uh, two different hats. One is as a cynic and one is as a futurist. So yeah. as you see things going in the future, um, if this continues and if we you know, don't get swallowed up by Kurzweil's singularity, uh, different singularity than those that you and Stephen Hawking and others have studied, but if you go right. forward, uh, still come a time when, you know, instead of my students uh, reading Brian Keating's interpretations of David Kaiser's lecture notes on quantum mechanics, uh, uh, you can, they can sit with the real one, not you, but your avatar, your hologram, something like this, in the not too distant future, or with Einstein himself. I mean, who would you rather learn, uh, you know, and sit down and ex pass notes to, and uh, and say, don't don't laugh at this joke, uh, like right. Aaron Fest does, uh, right. in your book. But but would you rather do that with, uh, you know, someone, uh, some some some, you know, uh, novice like me compared to compared to an Einstein. So looking forward, putting on your your future artificial intelligence uh, goggles. Um, where do you see the future of this open course we're going? And then and then that's the optimistic question. And then I have a cynical question uh, for you to address as well uh, with your dean hat on. So first. Okay. Do you see this being a possibility uh, accelerated by COVID uh, to really up our games as educators and perhaps move to augmented reality? I don't know about the augmented reality. I, I'm sure there will be um, at least at the margins. I think you're right. This will this will um, boost efforts that were already ongoing because now if for, if for much longer we're all staring at screens, people are going to get creative at how we at what screens we stare at and what we do with them. So I think you're right that that. That's likely to, to be one outcome. I do agree. I think MIT, not only MIT, but I think MIT uh, has been really um, very proactive now, as I say, for almost 20 years in, in trying to make uh, pedagogic materials available for free online with very few barriers or, or difficulties to access it. OpenCourseWare um, is, a, is a great example. That was the first one that we launched in something like 2003 or four. I mean, really, it goes back quite a way by now. Uh, uh, now that so has some uh, 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 classes that are in some sense captured, you know, full video lectures, full assignments, even assignment um, solutions and all that. A lot of it 
has um, pedagogic materials that would be helpful for, for self-study, but not really a substitute for the full class. Um, some lecture notes, not the full thing, maybe not videotaped lectures, but some, you know, hopefully helpful materials, but not, not quite a substitute. Uh, there are other platforms, MIT and other schools have, have even more, let's say, kind of immersive uh, pedagogy materials online as well. Um, and, I, and on this score, I'm, I'm very proud that we have been so proactive in getting these up there. We read these testimonials. They still come in every day, I mean, from literally all over the world, uh, from people who are really making use of these materials and who are uh, at least express real, real gratitude for them. And we think about, you know, uh, that kind of reach, I mean, uh, being able to hopefully at least ignite the imagination, let alone hopefully teach something even more specific and concrete to people who might never get to wonderful places like MIT or UCSD or, or any of our, our wonderful homes. That, I think that's, you know, that honestly gives me chills. I mean, we let, how can we do that more and better and, 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 more, and more effectively? Uh, so that's all good. I still am enough of a, if not a Luddite, at least a kind of old fashioned person. Say, on the other hand, I still think there's something really, really very important and, and so far hard to replace from in face, small group, you know, in the room together kind of, kind of interactions, pedagogical or otherwise. And so I don't think, you know, when we can all safely come, come back out of uh, a self isolation, of course, not all of us are in self isolation, many people are very bravely, uh, um, you know, out there in essential jobs even now. But when the rest of us, when, when us non-essential types, and I mean you and me in particular, Brian, when we can get, get our, our loud uh, safely back out, um, you know, I, I think we will have learned to do more things online effectively because of this forced period when we're doing them only online. I don't think it's going to be a switch that's thrown. And I think there's, we're going to rediscover things that we both enjoy and maybe just still do better face-to-face, -face, you know, pointing to this thing on a blackboard or really having a, a genuine kind of constructive, uh, interactive kind of debate or discussion, uh, you know, kind of uh, closer than only six feet away. I don't think that's going away. And I think we can get better around the margins and we'll do more and more things in the ways that we are kind of forced to try to adapt uh, now. I don't see it as an all or nothing. Um, so I, as the optimist, I think we're getting better at some important tools. And hopefully one, one effect of that will, will, is that we'll be able to bring some high quality materials to even more people in the world. And I think that will be just a great, great outcome of this. Um, I, but I don't think we'll stop um, you know, doing a very ancient thing, which is scratching one kind of rock on another, the chalk on a chalkboard. I mean, think about an unchanged pedagogical technique goes back kind of to the Greeks or certainly do a yeah. long, long way back yeah. that, you know, having a kind of sh everyone shared, not just seeing the same thing, which we can stand now kind of do, but really being kind of co-located. I don't think that's going away. Yeah. I'm sort of, you know, teasing about being a, a true cynic. I do think that there will have to be a role for these, for these, uh, you know, compete com competition for attention, uh, for focus. And I think there are values to, you know, uh, just as a simple example, you know, we both have uh, boy-girl twins, and uh, mine are mirror twins. Are yours also? Or no? No. Okay. So we, we our symmetry is broken literally there. But yeah. but at any rate, we have mirror. We have uh, twins and boy girls. And one of my uh, the daughter, she was you know she was t looking at me, and I was talking to her, and I was being you know my normal animated self, and she tried to like swipe my face. You know, she tried. So I was an iPad for a second. And, you right. know, it made me think about, you know, when I introduced, uh, you know, I got these uh, Google, uh, what are they called, uh, the Facebook uh, Oculus yeah. a couple of years ago. And my, you know, five-year-old at the time, he was really into it. And he was like on the space station, like floating mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. And it's so visceral that yeah, it's impossible to think that there isn't a role for that in the future. I don't think that right. that could be the only role. As I mm -hmm. said, you know, sitting down with me versus Galileo and learning about uh, the principles of, of Galilean relativity, mm -hmm. I know who I choose, and uh, you know, I don't have uh, as big an ego as as, uh, as Galileo did, but I would still choose him. And uh, you know, at the same time, I do think that with the I heard an interview, I think it was with the president of MIT. It might have been somebody else, but a very prestigious university there in Cambridge, uh, perhaps the one that begins with H. And uh, he was I'm sorry, basically I don't, saying, I don't know "Which one you mean? Which, which, which uh, there? was another one in Cambridge?" Uh, <laughs> oh, so there was, uh, and he was asked, you know, like how big could 
your university be? I think it was MIT. And he said, we, we could basically double, triple, you know, the, the, uh, the quality of applicants. Oh, yeah, is such no, that's that really true. Yeah. You that's could double true. or triple. So yeah. then with that being said, and with the fact that you have all this open courseware and with that, with the notion of accepting, you know, some role for, for electronic pedagogy and perhaps augmented or virtual, you know, virtual reality, mm -hmm. um, you know, is it, is it fair to deny, you know, some bright student in Mumbai, you know, the chance just because she's mm -hmm. not able, you know, she didn't win the Hunger Games application, you know, right. uh, competition to get into MIT, which is yeah. so selective or Harvard or wherever, or UCSD, right. even we turn away a tremendous number of people. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, in this era where, you know, I'm teaching my kids at home, um, you, you, you're probably teaching your kids as well. I forget how old they are, but, but you're probably at home and, and you're putting on your hat. And I'm just trying not to toilet train my, my graduate students while I'm teaching quantum mechanics to my two-year-olds. But Right, right. I Both mean, would probably benefit, by the way, from that. Yes, I, mean, I, th <laughs> I think they'd, they'd all have their own unique experiences. I, I'm a right. little more cynical that, that it, it, universities will have to adapt. I mean, I yes. see this even with my kids in their school, you know, in, their, in public schools here uh, and elsewhere, you know, just like anger and frustration frustration like, like hey my kid is you know i have to do it but you know it's two hours long and i'm covering everything that you said to cover you mm -hmm. know um so will pedagogy grow in that realm i, I agree i think people will, will have to have you know the kind of uh, sage on the stage but as you pointed out you know that model at least goes back to the university of bologna in italy and, and probably right. before but but at least in a formal university setting to to that phase uh in history in the you know uh, middle ages basically 1100 or so and my favorite uh anecdote from back not anecdote but just a tidbit trivia tidbit yeah. uh, i'm not quite that old um <laughs> but is that the students used to go on strike if they didn't like you know professor kaiser professor keating they would go on strike and you might think oh that's great now if you were students to teach no 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 you wouldn't get paid right, right. <laughs> so that's right on the other hand as, as you yeah. may know they couldn't get their degree until they threw a feast in your honor so <laughs> that's you know, right it came around the other way too i, I try to remind exactly. that i try to remind my advisees of that but you know commencement has been announced but who says you can graduate until you throw a, a big fancy feast for your professors but i'm gonna get away with, without doing that I yeah. demand it. Um, we weren't originally planning to talk about SETI, uh, which is chapter 14 in your book. Right. Um, I, I would love it if you would indulge me in, in talking about it just very briefly as we begin to wind up this, uh, this wonderful conversation. Sure. Uh, I'm having a, a, a wonderful young author named Sarah Scholes on my podcast tomorrow. Uh, she wrote a book called uh, They Are Already Here about mm. uh, aliens uh, being among us potentially and the popularity of aliens and culture. She previously wrote a book called Making Contact uh -huh. about uh, Jill Tarter and yeah. the Allen Telescope Array and, and our friend um, – Seth Shostak. Mm -hmm. And uh, your chapter 14, you know, kind of harkened back to a conversation we had here at the Clark Center, the, one of the last conversations before we were shut down out of uh, public lectures, and that was with Paul Davies, of, mm -hmm. uh, who makes an appearance in, in your book, right. uh, of, uh, of Arizona State and the, and the Origin Center, the Beyond Center, rather, uh, right. at, at uh, Arizona State University. And of course, he wrote a book, um, uh, called the eerie silence and in yeah. fact we celebrated back in january the 10th anniversary of its uh publication mm -hmm. and it was written on the 50th anniversary of the beginning of project osmo which you talk about and the right. and the seti program and the drake equation uh being constructed i wonder you know uh and so therefore the seti kind of uh the notion of seti search for extraterrestrial intelligence is 60 years old this year right. and yeah. uh you have this wonderful description of it and you talk about frank drake and his famous equation mm -hmm. and i wonder uh and and at one point you actually draw a linkage a bright line connecting the nuclear age yeah. with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence can you take us into the drake equation and drill down into that one crucial critical term that we have almost no idea about and and how it links the atomic age with the uh you know the nuclear age with this uh with this quest for uh, alternative extraterrestrial technology and intelligence Sure. No, I'd be glad to. And again, remember, I'm, I'm certainly no expert in SETI, though I did enjoy learning about it and I've written about it here. Um, but as you, as you say, Frank Drake um, introduced his now very, very famous equation uh, in the early 60s. I think it was 1961. It was really a way originally to help organize discussions. He wanted to organize different teams at a kind of upcoming conference or workshop who would each take on parts of this big kind of many-headed challenge. 
Uh, and so he was writing down terms that would ultimately be like, what would be the likelihood to, to expect to receive um, a signal from some ex intelligent extraterrestrial uh, civilization? And so for that, you'd have to have you know, a, a rate of uh, galaxies that form, a rate of planets, uh, habitable planets that form around you know, certain kinds of stars and all the kind of astrophysical things that people assumed at least would be prerequisites for life, at least as we would recognize it or know it. And the very last term in his equation was basically the average lifetime of such a civilization. And, it, and in 1961, in the heart, the, the sort of uh, immediacy of the Cold War, that was in, always taken to mean uh, how long till some smart civilization blows itself to bits with nuclear weapons, as indeed was a, a, a very real concern for many, many people around the world in the 1950s and, and into the early 1960s and beyond. And so L, that last term in this famous equation, it seems otherwise so you know, um, uh, un, depersonal, right? Galaxy formation, star formation, planet formation, all these wonderful, rich uh, topics in, in astrophysics and biophysics and so on. And the last piece, which it seems to kind of hinge upon, is um, for us to expect to receive a signal, they would need to have survived long enough, survived themselves long enough to build the technology to be ready to send out signals. So it came back to a projection on, are they going to blow, blow themselves up and are we going to? I, as I argue, it's, it's certainly not only me who said it. A lot of this feels like a kind of projection from ourselves onto the sky. I don't mean to say it's merely a projection, but it's certainly our assumptions about them are revealing about what we think about us. Uh, and, and that really has stuck with me since I first learned about the Drake equation, again, sort of as a high school student. It's not only Frank Drake, uh, some of the people who were instrumental in that even uh, two years earlier, like uh, Philip Morrison, uh, were also, again, kind of deeply embedded in a nuclear world, let's say, even more directly than Frank Drake in, in Morrison's case. Morrison had worked on the Manhattan Project. He actually was on the so-called um, advance team. who was among the first uh, non-Japanese people to inspect these sites that had been bombed uh, in August of 1945 by the atomic weapons, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, Morrison became very politically active after that, especially on matters of arms control and, and uh, denuclearization. And 50, almost 15 years after that very dramatic experience, he begins working quite seriously on astrophysics and, and what would grow into SETI. And again, he's sort of looking for beacons of a kind of benign, gentle other, a kind of wiser version of ourselves out there, partly, I think, because, at least I suspect, because he'd seen some pretty awful things that we could do to each other uh, right here. So we have this sort of moment of creation of SETI in its modern form in the late 50s and early 60s that's inescapably bound up with, with nuclear matters. Then there may be less expected uh, interactions in, in more recent times. So SETI has had a checkered history in terms of is it approved by um, either scientific bodies or by, in this case, the United States federal funding agencies, yes, no, yes, no, it has a, a kind of bumps along. Um, on the other hand, there have been some pretty dramatic technological spinoffs, much like, say, with the Apollo program, other big, massive science and technology projects. SETI uh, pioneers should rightly take pride in being very, very advanced in certain kinds of um, signal, multi, many, many multi-channel signal processing and other fancy electronics and data stuff, some of which then got reincorporated back into nuclear testing. So you have a kind of return the other way about some very cool advanced techniques being developed to try to look for you know, signals uh, of other intelligent um, civilizations that are being kind of refolded back into uh, some nuclear um, testing and simulations here. And my favorite example actually comes, I learned it from my very dear friend and mentor, Peter Gallison, who's a, a very distinguished historian and, and physicist at Harvard. And Peter uh, has been working on um, this effort to, uh, to try to, how do we deal with our own uh, nuclear waste on Earth? Many people worry about that, of course. But when you have kind of half-lives of the materials that are so far beyond the kind of in, human experience, tens of thousands of years, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, some of these very uh, exotic isotopes that are produced in the, in the course of um, producing weapons or, or materials for nuclear power in, in, in reactors. Uh, how do you dispose of those and then warn future generations who might not speak English? Why should we think English will be around 300,000 years from now? Might not read newspapers, I mean, you get the idea. How do you communicate with our own future selves about, again, what could become life and death materials. Don't dig here. That stuff can still make you sick. 
even though you have no notion of what the year, you know, 2000 or 2020 could possibly even mean, 300,000 years in the future or 150,000 years. So this group, uh, to try to figure out how to future-proof one kind of outcome of the nuclear age, brought in experts, including experts in SETI. How do you talk with some kind of radically distant other in a way that you both hope will recognize as a form of communication? So you have this kind of many step, uh, many stages dance between SETI and, and various aspects of our nuclear realities over the course of, of 50 or 60 years. So I think we'll, uh, I want to conclude with a set of questions that I call my final five. And these are uh, hopefully not in, uh, too, too impossible to answer. And I hope that they'll uh, leave the listeners with sort of a taste of, of, of you and, and the book uh, as well. But, um, but the, uh, what, I, what I like to kind of just finish up with is uh, how you come to the conclusion with a, you know, very interesting for, especially for physicists, this famous, famous book, uh, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, uh, the book about gravitation, in fact, called Gravitation. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about that book, although it's clearly had an impact on you, both uh, causing you to have sciatica, carrying it around <laughs> so many times, and uh, right. owning uh, multiple copies of it, as I guess you do with, with other books, uh, you, as you mentioned uh, in there as well, you know, Kolb and Turner. And, uh, That's right. But uh, according to Amazon, uh, you, you have not purchased a copy of Losing the Nobel Prize. Uh, it's very, very troubling to me. Um, but, uh, but Oh, that's because well, I, I got a free copy. Oh, you got a free copy. Oh, I see. Publisher, so that uh, was I see. Better. I see. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. I'm just teasing. Um, I want to talk to you as, as a fellow uh, bookworm, someone who loves books, yeah. thinking about that book and you, a, you go through this incredible detail and fascinating story about this massive, you know, three phone books worth 6.78 pound book. Right. Um, that's really the foundation of uh, many buildings, uh, literally, uh, but also yeah. of uh, education for theoretical and experimental physicists like myself or yourself. Um, talk, thinking about legacies and thinking about books like this, uh, one of the things I most like to ask my guests is where they see their legacy and how their book, if they are indeed author such as yourself, and many of the uh, guests are, but not all, um, what what do you see as a legacy? I, I've I've asked this of many different people, um, but you know, it, in in the context of um, sort of the DNA of the of the mind of the of the universe of ideas, uh, you've you've added this new uh, strain, a uh, helpful virus, positive virus. Uh, now many of them, and do you see books as a legacy? And um, I wonder if you agree with this statement that I heard, and I like to ask my author guests about. Um, would you rather have uh, one reader of of quantum legacies or the hippies a uh, hundred years from now or a thousand readers you know tomorrow basically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and i guess both is not on the table I think <laughs> they all be above. no um, i was gonna say a thousand years from now but let's you know well yeah, let, let's yeah. let's be realistic then then right. we'll both be holograms and we'll be teaching in real life so we will exactly right well I, yeah so i do i think very much like you brian i i do love books that maybe not a not controversial statement but i mean i love i love I love physical books. I really still do. I've gotten more comfortable reading on my, you know, tablet device, but for different kinds of reading. Um, I think about books a lot hi historically. I've written about the writing and, and reception of, of certain books that I personally have found so meaningful in my own, you know, development and thinking. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, and I, I should say I work closely with the MIT Press. I chair the editorial board. I think about how we make books and get them into the world uh, from slightly more practical points of view as well. And it's given how much time they take to, to, to write, to review, to copy edit, to, to produce, and to, and to stock shelves with, it's, it's remarkable how short the attention can be that most of them receive. Maybe we might say most of them deserve, but certainly that most of them receive. <laughs> Meaning it, it is the rare book that substantial numbers of people will be finding themselves going back to multiple decades after original publication. And so what's sort of been fun for me in the last several years as an historian is to think about when some sort of round number anniversary comes up, 50 years since blah, 40 years since blah, is to go back and think about what do the authors think they were doing back then as well as we, we can reconstruct it from the letters and co you know, correspondence and drafts that survive. What did readers make of it at the time? So look up the book reviews uh, and some books that have become 
you know, undisputed classics were panned at the time. That gives me a little hope at least. Right? <laughs> uh, of course, the, the inverse Never received a, a, a lower than a four star review as far as. No, 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 that's not You've true. Yet and, to receive one. <laughs> but, but the inverse happens too. People will celebrate these books when they come out and, you know, it becomes for who knows what reasons a kind of flash in the pan. Yeah. And so the books that break through, the books that we are still curious about that we'll pull off our shelves and reread generations later, those actually are pretty rare. Now, the book format uh, it, it enables that. I mean, I like to tell um, some of my uh, real digital um, uh, fans, you know, that's like people who I know who are, who are super fond of everything hyper, hyper modern. You know, we can still read uh, Isaac Newton's notebooks or Rene Descartes' correspondence because they use pen on paper. And paper has a much longer shelf life than my operating system on my tablet, right? <laughs> and so, thank goodness, you know, Galileo wasn't, uh, wasn't using some version of some uh, word process that's going to be um, unreadable 10 years later. So there is a, a literal physical staying power to the printed book that, I, yeah. <laughs> very, that my, my historian's profession couldn't really exist without. Uh, and, I, and I do think of that. We think about this thing, this object that we can you know, get out of the library. We can, take, we can pass it down to, to our friends or children or, or colleagues. And we can literally return to. And the object can be transporting and bring us back. I, I recently just uh, reread uh, Alan Lightman's just absolutely just charmingly beautiful novel, uh, Einstein's Dreams. It came out my senior year of college. So that already gets me thinking about you know, my younger self and where was I when I was, again, literally flipping through the pages on, in my college campus. Um, what does it mean to bring it off the shelf now in a very different moment in my own life and different stage of the world? We, we, have, we can have these kind of connections with the, with the printed book. And I don't mean to say that we shouldn't have our eBooks, but there's something about that. And, I, and, and like I say, I love the, the task of tracing through how did these objects, these special ones get put together? How were they thought of at the time? What did the authors hope? What did the reviewers think? And then what do we make of them from where we sit now? Mm -hmm. And in, in my own most recent book, you're right, I, I, I do that exercise with a number of books that have been kind of meaningful to me and to many other colleagues. And the one you mentioned, MTW, is one of my favorites, Ms. Mithorn uh, uh, Wheeler, uh, because it, it was sort of iconic. It was super strange when it first came out. It was intentionally kind of in a different genre or format than people were used to. It, had, it inspired these ecstatic responses. It was reviewed as if it were a novel. It's a 1,300-page graduate-level technical textbook with so many different equations. They had to have multiple fonts and not just the usual font that you and I would use today. It's a monster of a book. And it was being reviewed in like local San Antonio newspapers as if everyone should buy this thing. It's the most interesting thing. You know, it's a talk of the season. How on earth could that have been the case, right? So I love thinking about these books, again, as kind of objects in the world because readers bring things to them that might not be what the authors thought. It might not be what we bring to them today. And that's yeah. part of what I love about this constant dance of coming back to these books, which can open up new meanings to us now that meant things differently back then. I think they're just, I'm, I'm just, I love that exercise. I find it really fascinating. Yeah, and it's such a tremendous um, accomplishment to, to leave, not only, you know, for your own uh, kind of preservation in the amber of, of history, the sight, the smell, the, right. the texture of a physical book, of course, it's magical. I did, I did review, or learn an interesting fact that there are actually newer books like Maxwell's uh, Electromagnetism and Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, mm -hmm. which even though they're written much later than Galileo's books are actually much more rare because the paper they were printed on had a lot of acid in it and it dissolves over time mm -hmm. and becomes incredibly unstable, whereas the vellum and the, uh, the parchment that essentially that Galileo's books were published on makes them much more durable and saying thankfully for, for Newton. But yeah, those get your copy of uh, Darwin while you can. Right. Um, speaking of evolution and, and the DNA that we, uh, that we both mutually see and perceive through books. Um, speaking of books, um, the last kind of book question that I'll ask is uh, revolves around who would you rather have read this book? Uh, someone who's skeptical of the importance and the necessity uh, for a yet another quantum uh, interpretation, you know, quantum uh, ca caricature of, of characterization of, of quantum mechanics in the right. 20th and 21st century. We really need another book or someone who loves your stuff and loves to read <laughs> everything you put out and yeah. uh, fact check all your footnotes. Right, right, right. Well, again, ho hopefully some, some combination of all of the above. <laughs> I mean, I did, one of the things that I really enjoy, it's become a challenge I've sort of set for myself because it's hard. I mean, it's certainly hard for me, I should say. 
is trying to describe these really pretty crazy sounding ideas that people like you and I have this great privilege to, to sit with and play with all day in our professional lives and try to convey some part of that to non, to, to, to non physicists or non specialists. Um, at least to convey why seemingly smart people would even take that seriously, why it would keep us up at night, why we'd fight with each other and call each other names throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, the book is really written uh, in part for a kind of home team of, of, of our colleagues in physics and astrophysics and cosmology. I hope they'll find things they didn't know and would find interesting. But at least as much, if not more, it really is written for people who are curious about the modern sciences, not necessarily immersed in them themselves, and who I hope can, can come to appreciate a bit more of the embedding of this quest to know unavoidably in, in these uncertainties of our social and political worlds. We're all people. Uh, Einstein was just a person too, as was Stephen Hawking. We're all people in times and places. And some of the impacts that that embeddedness can have without our even recognizing it on the way we ask questions and the way we interact with colleagues and what we think is the right question even to pursue that's part of what I wanted to try to, uh, to, to really grapple with in, in this book. It is, as you mentioned early on, it's a kind of choose your own adventure. It's a, it's a collection of essays. They needn't be read in order. One needn't start on page one and read again. Um, it's kind of kaleidoscopic. I wanted to be able to get at shared themes from a few different uh, angles or like a, like a prism, you know? So a couple things will, will recur, but you don't have to kind of beat your head against it for 30 pages. It's like, here's one way of getting at that let's see it from in a different setting because because the ideas themselves are moving targets and the people pursuing them are embedded in a really these fast changing currents so i wanted to convey some of that the not just the humanness but the embeddedness the real unavoidable historicalness of our quest to try to find truths that we hope will not be bound to time and place we are bound in in history and hopefully some of these ideas will indeed uh you know kind of uh take on a life of their own no uh, that's uh, that's fascinating. I couldn't couldn't uh, agree with you more. Um, turning now back uh, towards uh, this uh, the the craft of what you do, and it's hard with people like you because you do so many things so well. Um, but the uh, but there's a there's a quote that appeals to me that I ask my guests about. I use it in. Um, in my book, uh, Losing the Nobel Prize, sort of the ending chapter, uh, and it's a quote by Soren Kierkegaard who said that life can only be understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. And thinking of the Arthur C. Clarke uh, quote that inspires the name of this podcast, which is Clarke's second law, you know, his first law is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, his, as the first guest on the uh, Into the Impossible podcast, you'll remember that, oh, maybe you won't, uh, I didn't. Uh, but anyway, that the second law of Arthur C. Clarke is that the only way to find out what is possible is to go a little bit into the impossible. Hmm. So with Kierkegaard's quote in mind that sort of life only makes sense in reverse, but we kind of have to live it with trepidation going forward. Uh, what, what, you know, kind of lessons have you learned or, or concepts or things that you might have felt were impossible as a, as a 20 year old, a 30 year old, as many of our listeners are, that mm -hmm. now seems, seems achievable or has been achieved because you took that courageous venture into the impossible? Well, that's a great question. I, I, I do, I, I, especially working on that Cosmic Bell project that we, we talked about in some mm -hmm. detail. At many points along that, that was about a five-year adventure. We're not done. We have new ideas mm -hmm. we'd like to, to work on. But that the kind of capstone really brought it together. And the course of four or five years, that's a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. And throughout much of that adventure and journey and heartbreak and roller coaster and all this, I literally kept pinching myself. Sometimes, I mean, literally pinching myself. Because I couldn't believe I had this opportunity. On the one hand, to work with these unbelievably gifted, tireless, just remarkably hardworking, smart very nice and collegial you know, young uh, grad students and postdocs. And at the same time, working with people that I had literally read about when I was a high school student. When I was uh, in, in high school in the 80s, I was, as I mentioned, just enamored of these new popular books on physics. I read about Alan Guth and the inflationary universe uh, in a book by John Gribben that I love called mm -hmm. In Search of the Big Bang that came out in the mid 80s. Uh, I learned about Anton Zeilinger and some of the early efforts to test quantum entanglement in, in similar books from that period. And here I was uh, kind of unbelievably able to work uh, directly with them and with this, this larger team to ask some kinds of questions that I'd first heard about as a 16 or 17 year old. 
Uh, and that's, I mean, I just still feel unbelievably lucky to have been able to, to have that kind of a journey and to participate. So on the one hand, I, I see this unbelievable energy, and, and I, I, it sounds maybe a little corny, but just inspiration from these incredibly, um, you know, kind of uh, all in grad students and postdocs who are doing things I, I will never be able to do, I certainly can't do now, and they, and they make it look easy. And on the other hand, connecting with these people who help get me even interested in this stuff and who are still working, working day in and day out uh, uh, you know, uh, after these uh, very prestigious, uh, long, productive careers. That's what I mean about these, I talk about, about a lot in the book about these generations. We have that kind of connection as, as educators, as researchers. We have this unbelievable opportunity to work with you know, at least three, if not more, generations. And, and that, that itself helps us, you know, move, helps us collectively move through time, even if, alas, we have to go in one direction and not always the one we might prefer. We're doing it in this kind of collective way. Mm. So, uh, and, and just thinking about connecting, as I say, my own kind of curiosities, hopes, dreams, clear misunderstandings and, and missteps, uh, and, then, and then trying to kind of bumble along and bumble through. Uh, the, we're not doing it alone, and, and, we, and we have many types of experiences and wisdoms on, uh, on which to build. And that's, that's just a remarkable feature of, of our line of work. It's great. Great. That's a very beautiful way to put it. Um, so the last question I have uh, that I share with my guests is whether or not uh, what you do can be taught. Uh, we spoke a lot about uh, pedagogy. Um, some guests say it can't be. Some say their special sauce is, uh, is somehow, you know, a byproduct of luck or circumstance. And uh, others say, uh, you know, they have a unique um, you know, ability for hard work, but perhaps other people could as well. Uh, for someone that is interested in pursuing the manifold careers that you've had, author, teacher, leader, um, et cetera, what, uh, what kind of uh, perspective do you bring? Do you feel like it is a, a teachable skill? Is it, is it something that is uh, possible to be transmitted uh, mentor to protege? I do think so. Uh, I think any of these. If we take the writing one in particular. And this book really grew out. It's a collection of essays, uh, most of which, almost all of which I had originally published as kind of one-off essays. And I didn't think of them as part of a larger project until, many, in some cases, some years later. Uh, so let's, let's think about that example. Uh, I was certainly not trained as a, as a writer in any sense um, or an essayist. Uh, I knew writers whom I admired and who I'd read for pleasure. And, 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 but it wasn't enough. I couldn't kind of reverse engineer it just from reading great authors. I mean, I, I certainly couldn't. Others maybe. Right. Uh, and so what I found, uh, and I tried to really emphasize that in the acknowledgments of the book, uh, where I felt like it could be a bit more expansive, is that I... I I had the great opportunity to practice and to get a lot of very patient feedback from some professional, from a, a number of professional editors. And they really could teach me things. I could be taught, right? And thankfully, I still have more than plenty to learn, but, <laughs> but I didn't have to do it on my own. And it wasn't just that I you know, read a book about how to do it. It was that, that interactive kind of dialogic back and forth, back and forth with, as I say, both generous and often very patient um, uh, editors. Uh, and so things, things like, you know, think about the structure of your essay. Don't just sit down and write. Oh, yeah, that's helpful. Um, think about a kind of opening um, uh, hook. Think about where you want it to go. What's the, um, don't bury the lead. You know, don't wait to tell us the point of the essay at the very end. These are definitely teachable. And they were things that I frankly had to be taught. So that's evidence that they're teachable. Um, and so, so that's an example from, let's say, the, the kind of the craft of writing, let's say that I absolutely have benefited from very specific kind of teachable moments from, from uh, a dozen or more uh, editors um, at a whole range of, of kind of venues. Uh, so yeah, so I think, I think many things can be taught. Of course, it will take the hard work and curiosity and the effort. I don't mean to say it's, uh, there's a formula to it, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's magic, actually, um, at least what, what I do. I think some people did things that, that still look to me like magic, and that's a different, maybe that can't be taught. But um, but the things that I know best, uh, they absolutely can be taught, and, and I and I'm proof because I've had you know amazing mentors and teachers along the way. Uh, phenomenal. Well, uh, David, we've come to the end of this uh, very uh, generous with your time conversation. Uh, I always think of you as a as a quantum mensch, and uh, <laughs> I, I always uh, I wish there wasn't a continent between us, quite frankly, and that we could spend more time together. Uh, because I always uh, just it's a delight to talk to you. You're uh, you're such a an amazing intellect, a good friend, a wonderful mentor. 
teacher, um, and of course, uh, the, the you know associate dean. As I come <laughs> to know you and love you as an associate dean, I know your uh, fellow faculty are lucky to have you. Uh, the last part is called the plug zone here. Um, you do not have a very active uh, social media uh, presence. I do not. That I could find, unless it might be in superposition somewhere. No. Um, uh, so I will uh, li give links to your website and to the book. Of course, I'll show the cover of the book. But uh, just an opportunity, are you working on another book? Are you working on any other projects you'd like our audience to be on the lookout for as they come down uh, the pipeline later on? Sure. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian. So. Um... Uh, I have a couple other book projects. We like to say book projects because that way you're not on the hook for when it's going to become an actual book. Um, a couple, one of which, uh, all of which I'm very excited about, one of which springs from the discussions we were having. I'm working exceptionally slowly on a, a, an undergraduate textbook on early universe cosmology with my very dear mentor and colleague, Alan Guth. And so being immersed in histories of textbooks that have meant so much to me and to other colleagues, now, you know, working hard to write a textbook is actually awfully fun to kind of close that loop a bit more. That won't be out anytime soon. We're working on it. I think it's, it, hopefully it'll be a value once, once we're done. But that's one that it's, it's again, it's a sheer joy uh, to, to, to get to work on. So stay tuned in the, you know, in the coming years, plural. <laughs> um, I'm working on a history book on uh, aspects of the history of Einstein's general theory of relativity, again, close to both of our hearts. That also is a project that I just thoroughly love. I've just enjoyed it. I've been picking away at it and able to write chapter versions here and there, but still partly because, um, you know, because there are a lot of things going on, it'll, it'll be a while till it's out. But it is one that I, I look forward to kind of reimmersing myself in now that this book's done and, and other projects I, I get to wrap up. So those are two on my mind. That's wonderful. Well, uh, congratulations on the tremendous accomplishment of this book, Quantum Legacies. I, I'll hold up a virtual copy here on my uh, iPad device until I can get my copy delivered uh, from the bookstore. We are uh, giving away books, copies of the book once things open up uh, for reviewers of the Internet Into the Impossible podcast on the iTunes store. So please subscribe, rate, and review. You too may win a copy of your own book, David. Uh, that one, wouldn't that be a treat? Um, <clears throat> <laughs> but uh, it'll certainly uh, be a treat to get you back on whenever you have anything new and hopefully uh, we'll get together under uh, w warm circumstances and we can uh, we can uh, share some uh, some more memories in the future. Thank you so much, David. It's, it's always a treat and a special one today. Congratulations. Brian, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate it. Stay well and stay well to, to, to your family and those of the people who are going to watch the podcast as well. Thanks Thank again. you, David. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.